I need one whole day to speak about the female infertility. And uh, to start with, I have nothing to disclose. And this is a picture. This is a painting by my youngest brother. I've got another one painted by my father, who is a professor of uh, psychiatry. And uh, always there is the doom of the rock in that picture. What I'm going to talk about is one case of infertility to show that PCOS is not as what our colleagues are talking to the patients that everyone who is having many follicles is a PCOS. And I will talk quickly about the history of infertility, the female infertility, and we will have a quick look with emphasis on the endocrinological part as my friend Dr. Hatim have pointed, this is an endocrine conference. We will focus more on endocrine aspects. And I will talk about the hormonal causes and how we go around the cases and how we investigate. And we should always remember the hypothalamic pituitary, uh, other endocrine axes, and its relation to the female infertility and points to be remembered always. And this is, this is one of my patients. She's 27 year old female patient, married for the last four years, presented to our clinic because she was trying to conceive. And for the last six years period, her menstrual period is scanty and comes and comes only if patient use progesterone withdrawal. And of course her menarche started at the age of eight uh, of ten until age of twenty her periods were mostly spotting. Her weight was on a steady increase from 80 kilograms in 2012 to 118 kilograms in 2017. And her weight now is 100 and her body mass index is 36.7. And her transvaginal ultrasound showed PCOS picture of both ovaries. And even the diagnosis was always polycystic ovary. And this is her hormone profile on day three. Her FSH is less than 0.01. Her LH is also less than 0.01. Prolactin is twice the upper normal and her TSH is high, 4.6. And this is her transvaginal ultrasound picture after giving her a mild stimulation with HMG injections. Again, we have given her some dostonics to bring her prolactin down, and her prolactin level came almost to the upper normal. Her TSH was down again because she had used 100 microgram of L-tyroxine. Again, all the time, she had her FSH and LH almost zero. And there is one entity called polycystic ovary-like abnormalities in women with functional hypothalamic amenorrhea. And the association of polycystic ovary-like cases with hypothalamic amenorrhea should not lead to a mistaken diagnosis of polycystic ovary. Actually, I have at least 
half of my patients coming to me uh, classified as polycystic ovary syndrome cases and only I found only 25% of this 50% to be truly polycystic ovary syndrome. But when treating patients, when we investigate female infertility, I refuse to see the female alone without her husband. I don't want to waste months of treatment and investigations and end up having a male factor infertility more severe than the female factor. So always they have to come, both of them, discuss with them what we found in both of them. For the history of infertility, the earliest recorded history was by the Egyptians. And again, we can find that in the history of Phoenicians, Greek, Romans, and this is all documented with all these Romans. And of course, the treatment of infertility in that time was only by prayers. But for infertility in general, when we look at the couple together, there are female factors and female factors. Usually the female factor is com constitute almost half of the cases and the male factor constitute almost one third. And we will focus on the, uh, the female factor infertility um, mainly on the endocrinological part. So we'll talk about hypothalamic uh, and pituitary causes, the uh, polycystic ovary syndrome, the premature ovarian failure, and the others. And this is the percentages of the disorders in the female infertility. And the majority will focus on the ovulation problems. Of course, the hypothalamic, uh, hypogonadism, the Kalman syndrome, the pituitary causes, may, majority of them are the hyperplectinemia and the pituitary damage, the ovarian, mostly the PCOS constitute the majority, premature ovarian failure, gonadal dysgenesis, and the luteinized unruptured follicle syndrome. The others like the hypo and hyperthyroidism also have uh, a contribution and the androgen secreting tumors. And of course, the um, other causes of the infertility, the secondary ones, when it comes to the surgical part. When we evaluate the female infertility, we used to say we wait one year and then we start investigating. Now the rule is if the patient is, is less than 35 years of age, we give them enough time. But less than, uh, after 35 years of age, we try to give them shorter time, usually six months. If they do not conceive, we, we go more aggressive. And the evaluation should start earlier when we have in the history some irregularity in the menstruation, if we have history of endometriosis and pelvic inflammatory diseases as well. Of course, the female infertility uh, is more than one third of the cases and the ovulatory problems constitute half of them. And the interaction between the ovarian and the other endocrine organs is very important. The hypothalamic causes in the female infertility should be considered uh, and investigated, especially the cases of hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism. And of course, we should know and we should remember always the, uh, the flow of the hormones in the menstrual cycle, starting from the day one of the menstrual cycle, until the end. 
And if we are going to measure the hormones of a female, the best timing is the second to third day to know the basal level of these hormones, the FSH, the LH, and the estradiol. Of course, the other types of hormones like the prolactin, the uh, TSH, we usually ask the patients to do them at any day of the menstrual cycle. Of course, we have to remember the follicular phase where the dominant hormone is the estrogen. And once the, uh, the oocyte is ready, ovulation will happen and the LH will surge. The value of the LH will be high. And this is in the normal regular, regular uh, cycle. And of course, the corpus luteum later will produce the progesterone to, con to complete the menstrual cycle. And we have to start from the pituitary. The pituitary is under the influence of the hypothalamus, so the gonadotrophin releasing hormones are very important, followed by the two major hormones which we should always think of, the FSH and LH, and of course, this will give the, uh, this will have a feedback by the level of uh, estrogen produced in the follicles. Again, the uh, progesterone produced later on will have the complete effect on the menstrual cycle. Of course, the anovulation are the majority of the cases, and the hypothalamus is the point to start with. The hypothalamic hypogonadism is the uh, first entity we should always remember. And those cases of anorexia nervosa, heavy exercise like the athletes, and uh, some entity which is the stressful type of uh, hypothalamic effect, also the Kalman syndrome, and there are isolated deficiency cases. The cases of chronic anovulation, like the PCOS and the hyperthicosis, also cause anovulation. And the hyperthalamic hypogonadism, like the premature ovarian failure and the Turner syndrome. Again, we have to measure some hormones to, to see how much is the ovarian reserve to diagnose the cases of hypogonadism. And of course, antimolarian hormone is a very important hormone, and you, you can, we can measure it at any time of the menstrual cycle. The FSH, LH, uh, the FSH and the estradiol are measured in the early stages of the uh, menstrual cycle, and uh, there is high variability between the two cycles of these two hormones, and. The LH and estradiol at the moment of ovulation are of value. It tells us about the quality of ovulation. And the progesterone and estradiol in the luteal phase tell us about the quality of the corpus luteum. Again, the hypothalamic pituitary dysfunction, like the cases of the craniopharyngioma, the pituitary adenoma, arteriovenous malformation and uh, central space occupying lesions, in addition to the chronic liver diseases and chronic renal failure, can cause low serum LH, FSH, and estradiol. Again, the same. At the second day of the menstrual cycle, we will find that those cases of hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism are having low estrogen and low, uh, lower inappropriate normal FSH-LH ratio. Those cases of hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism usually have absence of pubertal development and they have a single endocrine factor potentially to be highly fertile when ovarian responsiveness is restored. And those cases, usually we give them a combination of FSH-LH injections, which is called HMG. The, hypo, the hypergonadotropic hypogonadism 
caused by a defective gonads resulting in hypogonadism and high level of gonadotropies. And usually these patients tend to be aminoric and hypoestrogenic and category includes all variants of premature ovarian failure. In the pituitary, we have always to remember Sheehan syndrome, the uh, postpartum uh, necrosis due to postpartum hemorrhage. And of course, in the hypopituitarism, the hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism in cases where these patients are having amenorrhea and infertility and low estradiol again and FSH, LH inappropriate, inappropriately lower or normal. So these hormones are the hormones we investigate our patients with. And as I said, the estradiol, the FSH, LH, we measure them on the uh, second day of the menstrual cycle, especially if we are going to treat them with assisted reproduction. NHPN, because it's, it has too many variabilities, we do not use it. NHPN B, it's not a regular one. But before we start a treatment for those patients uh, with infertility, we should make sure that prolactin level is within normal, thyroid hormone level is within normal. Few cases we have to check on their growth hormone. Those cases of, of hyperandrogenism, we need to check their free testosterone, dihydroibiandosterone sulfate, and androstein diol. The only important test for us, as I said, TSH and prolactin at the time of the period, FSH, LH, and estradiol, and the progesterone after the 21st day of the cycle. And estradiol hormone alone is of little value. Um, usually we use the uh, estradiol to tell if we are going to start a treatment. And when we start a treatment on the second day of, um, of the cycle, uh, we should have an estradiol of less than 50. Some might accept 80, but usually the cutoff point is 50. If we start with more than that, the response will be poor and we will have less collected number of oocytes. FSH hormone, usually we measure it on the second or third day and we should have a level of less than 10. And of course, the hormone increases with age. Uh, it's an indirect biomarker of ovarian reserve, um, influenced by inhibin B and estradiol, and the assay are well standardized now, and it has an, a high inter and intra variability that's why it's having um, uh, low reliability. FSH decreases with age. And of course, with the increase of FSH level, um, the success of the assisted reproduction decreases. And as you see in the, in the chart here, by the age of 42, the level of FSH is becoming high and the success of the IVF become less and less. Of course, the cutoff point for the FSH is around 11.4 because at that level, it has a, the high specificity and the low sensitivity at that, at that level. The day three basal FSH will give us a clue about what's going to be the response. If the patient is having an FSH is less than 10, she will have a good response. And her ovarian response to the stimulation will be the best. If between 10 and 12, it's a borderline, and this will be reflected by slightly reduced live birth 
rate. Between 13 and 15, it's elevated and it will reduce the ovarian reserve. It will uh, reduce the response to the stimulation as well, reduce the life birth later on. But the level between 16 and 20, this is a markedly elevated FSH, and it will lead to a reduction in the embryo quality at this stage. And of course, the live birth rate will be affected as well, and the response to the stimulation is very, very poor. And because of that, of course, after 20, it's a very poor response. And because of that, those females who are above 40, it was advocated to give them what's called soft protocols, soft stimulation. We do not stimulate them too much. And our aim usually is to get what's available of the follicles there, what's available of the eggs in the ovaries at that stage. Of course, this is a comparison between the follicular stimulating hormone the estradiol and the anti-mullerian hormone. And the anti-mullerian hormone is the hormone which, with which we measure the reserve, the ovarian reserve. And it is a direct and indirect assessment of the ovarian status when we use the follicular, follicular stimulating hormone and as well with the estradiol. But the direct measurement of the AMH will tell us how much is the reserve there in the ovaries. The AMH is secreted by the ovarian granulosa cells and it will tell us later about the level and the response of the ovaries when we do stimulation. Now we move to the thyroid gland. Can thyroid problems lead to infertility? Yes, the answer is yes. All women who have difficulty in conceiving or who are planning to become pregnant are strongly advised to seek medical advice as to whether their thyroid problem may be a cause to their infertility. And to us, we do not start any stimulation to patients with infertility without knowing their TSH level. Of course, prevalence of abnormal thyroid stimulating hormone an infertility population, uh, it is 6.3 in an ovulatory infertility, 4.8% in unexplained, and 2.6 in tubal infertility. In one study, 23% uh, of women having hypothyroidism and irregular periods uh, were found to have an ovulation. Another study confirmed the hypothesis that fertility is impaired in women with autoimmune thyroid diseases. Uh, I remember 20 years ago, the um, Hashimoto thyroiditis cases, which we were treating, were very much less than what we are seeing nowadays. We are seeing more and more cases of Hashimoto thyroiditis coming with, uh, with symptom for treatment with infertility. The association between the autoimmune thyroiditis, infertility, and or successive, pre successful, successive pregnancy loss is still controversial. In one study evaluated women with and without immune, autoimmune thyroiditis, all of the women were aothyroid during a cycle of in vitro fertilization reported significantly lower rate of oocyte fertilization and the grade A embryos in 17 women who were tested positive for anti-TPO and anti-TG antibodies. But there were no differences detected in positive pregnancy tests and early miscarriages. Autoimmune diseases, again, autoimmune thyroid, thyroid dysfunction is the most common. Graves disease affects around 1% of the population, while Hashimoto affects almost 3% of the population. But there are no data of the prevalence of those cases with infertility. 
This is a quick workup for infertile women with potential thyroid problem, and it goes systematically. The, the next hormone which we are going to talk about is the prolactin. First was discovered in 1928 by Steiker, and um, of course it has a circadian rhythm influence, and of course it has a very short life. But we have to remember not all hyperprolactinemia is due to prolactinomas. And of course, it's very frequent. 33% of infertility cases have hyperprolactinemia. And again, the PCOS cases are almost between 20 to 50% of them having prolactin, prolactin problems. Hyperprolactinemia is found in 30% of women having amenorrhea and 70% of women having both amenorrhea and galactoria. And measurement is an indirect, uh, is indicated in all cases of galactoria. Of course, the level of prolactin, when it is high, it affects the level of LH and FSH, as you can see in the two graphs here. The hyperprolactinemia suppresses both FSH and LH. Again, the manifestations as galactoria, ovarian, ov ovulatory dysfunction, and menstrual problems as well. Of course, the treatment is not uh, parlodale. Parlodale is an obsolete medication. Now the the treatment is with capergoline, dostonix, and the hyperprolactinemia, usually those cases who are having infertility and hyperprolactinemia, we start giving them the uh, capergoline the moment we find out that they have hyperprolactinemia. These are the sites of the, where the effects of the hormones, the AMH, effect is mainly on the primordial follicles, the early development of the uh, follicles, uh, and the medium size, the antral follicles, are affected by the inhibin, while the FSH only affect the uh, follicles at the preovulatory and the early antral follicles. That's why the AMH is the most reliable to tell us about the ovarian reserve. And of course, by the time of birth, we have in both ovaries something like 2 million follicles, 2 million oocytes, and by the age of puberty, this comes down to almost 400,000. And with age, the AMH level reflects how much we have reserved in these both ovaries. And of course, the number of oocytes again decreases with age up to the age of 50. The, the, the infertility as well increases with age. We have to remember that those who are postponing the family I mean, those women who are thinking that with the assisted production, they can gain the uh, process of time, it is not. We advise all those who are planning to have a family, the moment they get married, to start, to start conceiving. And sometimes it takes a bit of time for them to have children, and the infertility with age increases. So those who get married late, they should think, first of all, how they can conceive and as early as possible. Infertility increases with age, so they should not postpone the family if they have the intention to form a family. Again, infertility, at the age of 20 to 24, for example, 
7% of the females are having infertility, while at the age of 40, almost 30%, one third of the females are having a problem of infertility. The reason I'm saying that because if you look at the time, the first birth of women between the year 1996 and the 2014, you will see that the first birth is coming late in their life. Again, percentages of married women who are infertile and this was studied extensively and showed that with, with time, the fertility decreases. The AMH and the ovarian reserve, of course, the AMH is the best, ovaria, uh, a best indicator of ovarian reserve. And for those patients who are coming with infertility problem, we have always to remember to check their AMH. It can be done at any time of the period not specifically at a certain day, and um, it reflects how much reserve they have. Of course, the AMH decreases with age. You can see that here. Again, you can see that this is the average, and this is the median of AMH, and by the age of 50, it's become almost zero. It's a glycoprotein, appears in the, in the serum of the female at puberty, secreted by granulosa cells, of course, and less cycle-to-cycle -cycle variation as compared with the FSH, and is not affected by the agonist, the GnRH agonist, and of course, clinical role not definitely established yet. The problem is that it's an expensive hormone to be tested. Of course, the other markers of the ovarian reserve are the age, the basal FSH, LH, uh, FSH, estradiol, inhibin B, AMH, and the ratio of FSH, LH, the basal ovarian volume and the antral follicles count, and the ovarian stroma and the blood flow. And with cases of reduced ovarian reserve, we can diagnose that by the anti-Mullerian hormone. We can also with the FSH and estradiol, with the LH and estradiol, with the progesterone as well. Those cases who are coming with low ovarian reserve and wants to conceive, some have recommended to give them DHEA so that we can recruit more follicles. Some believe that it's too late because the, the oocytes are already in the phase of genetic changing and the chromosomal problems are there. So if you are going to recruit more of these follicles, the reality is that the follicles are containing an old type of oocytes. That's why now it's recommended to do a freezing of the oocytes at the younger age. This is the study which showed that we can recruit more of the oocytes. Of course, again, the ovarian reserve uh, decreases with, with age and the infertility increases at that as well. One important entity is the polycystic ovary syndrome because it's the most common endocrine disorder. I wanted to speak a little bit about it. I want to say that it's only maximum 15% in any population. It's, the most important is how to diagnose and how to look at the different ethnicity classifications. And of course, 
85% of the ovulatory problems are PCOS. The brain does not produce GnRH in normal cycles. That's what happened in the PCOS. And this will cause LH levels to rise, FSH levels to drop, and the LH causes ovary to produce more testosterone and the ovary is unable to produce the egg. And that's the main reason why we have an ovulation. And in the basic hormonal workup, we should remember to do FSH and estradiol and LH. And we have to differentiate it between it and ovarian, premature ovarian failure and the hypothalamic aminuria. We should check on the free testosterone, prolactin and TSH, and the progesterone. Other optional, of course, is the testosterone, total testosterone, and the 24-hour urine cortisol. This is how PCOS impact our fer uh, fertility with irregular cycle, with hormonal imbalance, with ovulatory dysfunction, and with prolonged monthly cycles. And this is how the hyperinsulinemia also act on the liver to reduce the six binding globulins, and this increase free testosterone, and this will increase the LH production by the anterior pituitary relative to FSH, and this will cause T cells to be stimulated and cyst formation. And this is the insulin resistance. I don't know how we can understand anything from such a picture. The adrenal part is the congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And of course, the ovarian part is the polycystic ovary syndrome. And there are recommendations by two bodies, the ISHRE and the European Society of Human Reproduction and Embryology and the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, how to handle those cases and how to classify those cases of PCOS. Just we want to emphasize on one point, the hypothalamic aminuria and the PCOS, and how to differentiate between both of them. And of course, the elevated androgens and the low and normal androgens are very important. And of course, the high LH-FSH ratio and the low LH-FSH ratio in PCOS and the hypothalamic aminuria. The hypothalamic aminuria, of course, is uh, psychological stress, anorexia nervosa, weight loss, all these can cause hypothalamic aminuria. There is an association between hypothyroidism and PCOS as well. Hashimoto thyroiditis, increased TSH, and decreased T3, T4 for 40% of the people who are having uh, Hashimoto thyroiditis are having PCOS. And of course, with PCOS, there is increase in estrogen, so they are in hyperestrogenic state. Again, the recommendation of metformin for the insulin resistance of patients of PCOS. So what test to select? Usually, we select FSH, antral follicle count, and AMH to predict each individual case, how they are going to respond, whether they are going to be high, highly responsive or not responsive. And that choice depends on the lab availability and the skill of the ultrasonographer as well. Uh, of course, the others like the ovarian volume, ovarian blood flow, NABMB, and estradiol alone, and the clomiphene saturate challenge test are of less value. This is how we work up the cases of infertility for us. We check FSH estradiol and we compare the anovulatory process to end up with the uh, hypergonadotrophic hypogonadism and the hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism and the other tumors like the ovarian, the adrenal to be excluded. One thing to mention about the acromegalic as well, 
Women with acromegaly present with menstrual irregularity and anovulatory infertility. Um, a direct role of growth hormone and uh, IGF-1 excess on the hypothalamus pituitary gonadal axis, hyperplactinemia, and an impaired gonadotrophin secretion related to a tumor mass effect or polycystic ovary have been suggested as a possible mechanism to relate that to infertility. Acromegalic and Cushing diseases may impair fertility at different levels, and but the mechanism is still ill-defined. The premature ovarian failure, as I said, it's present in 1% of women under the age of 40, 0.1 under the age of 30, 0.01 under the age of 20. We are seeing cases of premature ovarian failure. They are not uncommon in the society. But unfortunately, we have very limited options for them. And the only option is to keep them with HRT so that they will not go into the menopause. Now, there are in the future, uh, in the uh, very near future, we are hoping that we will have something as a treatment for them involving the stem cell and what's called the artificial ovary. And of course, with the high FSH level, uh, those patients will go into menopausal problem. Uh, the causes are different. Familial causes are uh, to, to be remembered in our society, but there are many other things like the idiopathic, the autoimmune, the uh, myasthenia gravis, thrombocytopenia, all these diseases can lead to premature ovarian failure. In one collection of cases, out of 100 patients coming for infertility treatment, we ended up having only eight ending with treatment and successful. So it's not an easy task at the end. This is the way we look at the cases of ovarian uh, infertility. This is how we treat them. They end up having ovulation induction, artificial assisted reproduction technologies, or those hyperplactinemic cases, we give them um, the capergoline, the dostanex treatment. So in summary, the evaluation of female infertility must consider etiologies other than ovarian and uterine anomalies. There are common endocrine disorders that manifest with infertility due to hormonal changes and the management of endocrine causes of female infertility require prompt identification and targeted management. Thank you.